This presentation is part of a lecture series on the C++ programming language by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. For those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given on this slide. In this section, I'm going to be introducing the version control system known as Git. One very popular version control system is Git. Git employs a distributed, that is decentralized, model for version control and is open source software. Git was created by Linus Torvalds, the creator of the, the Linux kernel, and it was developed uh, back in 2005. Essentially, Linus needed a new version control system to be used to manage the development of the Linux kernel, and since there was nothing suitable for him to use, he developed his own. And since then, it's become very successful. Uh, Git was designed to support projects that vary in size from very small to very large. Uh, due to its speed and efficiency, it can handle very large projects, but it also works very well with small projects as well. It can handle projects that have very large numbers of files and also very large numbers of parallel branches, so situations where you may be doing a lot of parallel development. In Git, the revision history of files are modeled using a directed acyclic graph, also known as a DAG, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And the URL for the website, the official website for Git, is what's listed at the bottom of the slide here. Git is quite popular. It has a very large user base. It is used heavily in industry as well as for many open source projects. Some of the organizations employing Git are listed on this slide and include many major technology companies such as Apple and Google and Microsoft. Some open source projects employing Git are also listed on this slide and include projects such as the Linux kernel, Android, and Qt. To begin, we need a very basic understanding of how Git organizes its version control information. When we use Git, we want to track all changes made to the files in a particular directory tree over time. So Git must somehow record the entire revision history for this directory tree. To record the revision history, Git uses a database called a repository. Each time a new version of the directory tree is to be added to the revision history, Git must take a snapshot of the directory tree contents. This snapshot records the location of each file in the directory tree as well as the file's contents. Such a snapshot is more formally known as a commit. In this sense, at the most basic level, the Git repository can be viewed as a collection of commits, with one commit for each version of the directory tree stored in the repository. Although, at the most basic level, a Git repository is a collection of commits, a repository actually has more structure than this. For the purposes of version control, it is also important to capture which commits are derived from which other ones. In other words, it is important to capture how the directory tree under version control evolves over time. For this reason, the revision history for the files under version control is represented as a directed acyclic graph, or DAG for short. Each node in the graph represents a particular commit in the repository, and each edge in the graph points to the immediately preceding commit in the revision history. So by tracing the edges in the graph, the evolution of the directory tree over time can be seen. On this slide, I have a simple example of a repository represented in the form of a directed acyclic graph. The repository contains eight commits, which are labeled with the names from C0 to C7. So if we look at this example here, commit C0, we can see that this is actually the first commit that was ever put in the repository. The reason for this is there's no edge coming out of C0, meaning that C0 has no predecessor, meaning it wasn't derived from some earlier version, meaning that it must have been the first version. If we go on to commit C1, we can see that C1 was produced by modifying commit C0 because the arrow here is pointing from C1 to C0, meaning C1 is derived from C0. And then if we follow along, C2 was derived by making changes to C1, C4 was derived by making changes to C2, C6 is interesting, it's what we call a merge commit. It was produced by making changes to both C4 and C5 and then merging them together. And then, for example, C7 is produced uh, by making changes to C6. If we think of the revision history in terms of a directed acyclic graph, we can see that there are many possible ways in which we might derive new commits from old ones. Different choices in this regard will lead to different branching workflows. The figures on this slide depict two branching workflows commonly used in practice. The first workflow, shown in the top figure, consists of just a single branch, which is usually called master. In this workflow, the commits form a single linear chain. 
And this workflow would correspond to always choosing to derive version n of the directory tree from only version n minus 1. The second workflow that's shown on the slide involves three branches, a master branch, a development branch, and then what's called a topic branch. The master branch is used for software releases and contains only highly stable, well-tested code. A development branch is used for development work and contains code that is not necessarily stable. And the general idea is at times when the code in the development branch becomes sufficiently stable, it can then be merged into the master branch. And a topic branch is a short-lived branch that might be used for working on a small feature. When the work on the topic branch is complete, it would typically be merged into the development branch. From the point of view of a user of Git, there are three distinct types of data upon which the user can operate. The first type of data is the working tree. The working tree is simply a directory tree containing all the files on which the user is working. This is the data that the user directly modifies in order to eventually make changes to a repository. The second type of data is the index, also known as the staging area. This is the place where any changes that are tentatively marked to be committed to the repository are stored. The third type of data is the repository, which is the database used to store the directory tree under version control, as discussed previously. From the point of view of the user of Git, there are three basic local operations that the user can perform on the above data. The first operation is checking out. And this particular operation populates the working tree with a particular version of the data from the repository. So in other words, it copies information from the repository here into the working tree. The second operation is staging. This operation propagates changes in the working tree to the index, also called the staging area. In other words, it takes information in the working tree here and propagates it into the index. The third operation is committing. This operation propagates changes in the index to the repository. So in other words, it propagates information from here to the repository here. So to make a change in the repository, the user first makes a change in their working tree. Then they perform a staging operation, which propagates that change into the index. Then they perform a commit operation to propagate the change from the index into the repository. Since a Git user works directly on their own local repository, most operations in Git are local. Sometimes, however, the need arises to propagate changes from one repository to another. On this slide, we examine the basic non-local operations that allow information to be propagated between repositories. The first of these operations is cloning. A clone operation creates a new local repository that is a copy of an already existing remote repository. Three other basic operations are provided in order to propagate changes between repositories. The first of these operations is a push. A push operation propagates changes from the local repository to the remote repository. The second operation is a fetch. A fetch operation propagates changes from a remote repository to the local repository without attempting to merge the changes with local data. So in other words, a fetch operation propagates information from the remote over to the local repository. The third operation is a pull. A pull operation propagates changes from the remote repository to the local repository, but unlike the case of a fetch operation, it also merges the changes with local data. So again, a pull operation is moving in this direction from the remote repository to the local repository. In practice, the very first operation that a user typically performs is a clone operation. This creates a local copy of a repository to which the user can then make changes. When a user has made changes to their local repository that they would like to publish to others, a push operation can then be used to propagate the changes to a repository that others can access. When a user would like to incorporate changes from others in their own work, a pull or fetch operation would be used to retrieve these changes. As part of the repository state, Git maintains the notion of a current branch or commit. This current branch or commit is referred to by the name head, all in uppercase. The significance of the head is that it identifies the commit that is to be the parent, that is the prede predecessor, of the next commit added to the repository. In effect, the head determines where new commits are attached in a directed acyclic graph representing the revision history of the repository. Although the head is used to identify a commit, the head can name either a commit or a branch. In the case that the head names a branch, the head is associated with the commit at the tip of that branch. 
In practice, it is most common for the head to name a branch. In the case that the head instead names a commit, the head is said to be detached. The head is set, for example, uh, by a checkout operation. Consider a repository that has a single master branch and three commits C1, C2, and C3, with C3 being the most recent. If the master branch is checked out, the head will be set to the master branch. This ensures that the next new commit will be added at the tip of the master branch because the head refers to the master branch, the master branch refers to the commit C3, and this is going to be the parent of any new commit that's added. So if we added a new commit C4, its parent would be C3. So again, effectively the head is determining where new commits are added into the repository. As we saw earlier, Git offers a number of operations for synchronizing data between repositories, including clone, push, fetch, and pull operations. As it turns out, in order to be able to correctly synchronize data between repositories, it is necessary for Git to remember the state of branches from a remote repository each time the local repository is synchronized with that remote repository. This leads to the notion of what is called a remote tracking branch. A remote tracking branch, also known simply as a remote branch, is a placeholder in the local repository for a branch in a remote repository. A remote branch is a reference to a commit and is used to record in the local repository the commit to which a branch in a remote repository is referring at the time that the local repository was last synchronized with the data from the remote repository. Remote branches never change as a result of strictly local operations on a repository. Such branches are only updated when an operation is performed that synchronizes the data in a repository with that in a remote repository. In simple terms, remote branches act as bookmarks to remind Git where the branches in the remote repositories were the last time that Git connected to them. In order to better illustrate the concept of a remote tracking branch, I'd like to consider an example. So suppose that we have a remote repository whose commit history is as shown here. So we have a single branch called master with the commit C1, C2, and C3 on it, where C3 is the most recent commit. If we clone this repository, what we'll end up with is this information here gets copied. So in the cloned repository, we end up with what's shown here. And not surprisingly, we get a copy of the information from the repository that we cloned from. However, what might be surprising is we get this extra piece of information here, this origin slash master, which was not in the repository that we cloned from. This origin slash master is what we call a remote tracking branch, or just a remote branch for short. The origin in the name origin master is just a nickname for the repository that we cloned from. And master is naming a branch. So what this origin master refers to it's referring to the master branch in the repository that we cloned from. And what this is saying, the master branch in the repository that we cloned from, when we last synchronized with the repository that we cloned from, which was when we just cloned it right now, the master branch in the remote repository is pointing to the commit C3, which is clearly the case here. If we look in the remote repository, the master branch is pointing to the commit C3. So this is used to keep, a remote tracking branch is used to keep track of at the time that we last obtained data from the remote repository, where was a particular branch pointing at that point in time. The reason why we need the remote tracking branch, it's not good enough just to have this master branch here, is that when we start changing the local repository, this master branch will move. For example, if we add a new commit C4 to our local repository here, the master branch will move from pointing to C3 to pointing to our new commit C4 which means we can't rely on the master branch to tell us where the master branch is pointing in the remote repository because this master branch here is going to move as we change our local repository. Similarly, we couldn't just go in back and look at this repository here either because this master branch here will move as people make changes to this repository. So if a new commit is added here, this will move as well. So this is the reason why we need a remote tracking branch. It's, it's the only way that we can know for certain where, what state the remote repository was in in the time that we cloned from it or last synchronized from it. Git has a number of configuration settings and there's three levels of these settings, local, global, and system. And they're in decreasing order of priority. So a local setting will override a global setting. A global setting will override a system-wide setting. Local settings are settings which apply just on a per repository basis. Global settings apply for all repositories that a user is using. And then system settings are system wide to all users on the system. On many systems, these system settings 
require administrator privileges to set. So from a practical point of view, often the local, local settings and global settings are the only ones that a typical user involves themselves with. And then lastly, on Linux systems, the global settings are typically stored in a file under your home directory called .git config. On this slide, I have provided a brief outline of the typical usage pattern for the most basic git commands. So when a user first starts using git, typically the first thing that they'll want to do is use the git config command to set a number of configuration parameters, including the username and email address for the user. Then next, the next thing typically a user will do is use the git clone command in order to clone a repository so that they can start working with the repository. So here the repository is some already existing repository and the directory is simply the directory into which you want to clone the repository. So this will become the directory for the working tree. Then once the repository has been cloned, probably the user wants to start making some changes to it. So they'll then edit the working tree and then stage some changes as appropriate the local repository. So that this might involve doing git add to add some new files to the repository or to add modifications to existing files, the git mv for move command to rename files, and the git rm command to either remove files or remove directories. Then once the user has made the changes that they want to their working tree, typically the next thing they'll do is they'll want to commit these changes and put them into the actual repository. So to do this, often it's a good idea to do git status before doing a commit, just to find out what it is that's actually going to be committed. Then we proceed to do git commit. Then once the changes are propagated to the repository, often we'll want to push our changes to a, the remote repository from which we cloned our original repository. And to do this, we would perform the git push command. Sometimes when we do a push operation, the push operation will fail because in the, between the time that we cloned the repository or last synchronized with it and the time that we're pushing now, some other changes have been committed to the repository. So our local repository is out of date with the remote one, in which case then we would perform a git pull or a git fetch followed by a git merge in order to retrieve the changes that have made, been made to the remote repository since the time that we last synchronized with it. Then we would be able to do a push at that point.